good to have everyone here. This morning we're going to be looking at the words, some of the words from the cross and that of descriptions of uh, the one who is on the cross. Let's go to, uh, for the moment, actually for the moment, let's, let's go back to Psalm, uh, Psalm 22. Psalm 22, and we're going to begin in verse 30. Psalm 22 in verse 30. A posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. I want to read that last verse again. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this this. What is that saying? That is saying that there would be a time when what David is writing, because David writes this psalm, that what occurs in this psalm, this psalm is a prophecy. And here as part of that prophecy is the assurance that what God did will be recounted to those who weren't even born in his day. And he also says to the next generation, to a generation that hasn't been born. And here we are doing that. We're doing that very thing today, showing that what David wrote came to pass. And it's come to pass for centuries. As far as recounting what God did, that the Lord has done this. He is the one who did this, who did what? Well, let's look at what Psalm 22 is about. But first, let's just see some things here. Let's begin, if you will. Let's go all the way to uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter uh, 27. And we have Jesus on the cross, Matthew chapter 27 beginning in verse 45. Jesus is hanging on the cross. It is a public execution. Uh, the Romans did not invent this. Uh, it was invented uh, much earlier, I do believe by the Persians who invented this form of execution. The Romans just continued in it. It is meant to be, show someone as an example of this is what's going to happen to you if you're not following the rules. If, if you uh, are a lawbreaker, th this is what's going to happen. Well, Jesus was not a lawbreaker at all. Pilate even confirmed that. But the Jews, especially those who were uh, of the elite, those who were of the, the uh, Sanhedrin court, the high priests, the elders, the scribes, the Sadducees, many of the Pharisees, they wanted him dead. And they did whatever it took, whatever it took to get him there. And here Jesus is under excruciating pain, and we're going to see that being described not in the book of Matthew, but in Psalm 22. But he said, here we have this, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, here in this first bit, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is the pronunciation of the original Hebrew of Psalm 22. That's what he's quoting. He's quoting Psalm 22. And the fact of the matter is, when he quotes that, those who know anything, scribes would have done it. Uh, scribes could have known. Those who knew anything about Psalm 22 would understand they're witnessing Psalm 22 right in front of them. They're witnessing it occurring right there. And he says these words. Now, what, their, what a response is shows the faith 
of the people around him. The faith of the people, what their faith is in. It's not in God so much, and it's certainly not in his Christ. But look at what they say. Verse 47, some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Now it is true that the name Elijah and the name, the, the, if one were to pronounce those names, that they, or rather, uh, that Eli, Eli, that Elijah's name being pronounced could sound very similar to those words. But obviously, the ones, because it says, it says some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. That is some, that's not everybody. Some of them did. Some of them, these some had no idea that he just quoted Psalm 22.1. They had no idea that's what he just did. Why wouldn't they know that? Because their faith is not in God. Their faith isn't to where they would actually know those words of, oh yeah, I, I, that sounds very familiar. Where's that from? Psalm 22. Right. That's exactly right. No, but where is their faith? They're saying, Elijah, he's calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, the rest, this is more than one, said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. They actually are looking to see if Elijah will come. Why would they even think that? Why would they think, first off, that he would be calling to Elijah? Because Elijah doesn't have this kind of power. You're praying to Elijah? Who does that who's faithful to the Bible? Were they praying, these, these some, these, these uh, verse 49, the rest, do, would they see that as being a common thing, that yes, one would pray to Elijah? It's very similar to the faith we see of the rich man there in Luke chapter 16, who ends up in torments, and he speaks to Abraham, who's not in torments, he's too is in the Hadean realm, talking to Abraham and saying, send Lazarus back. To talk to my brothers. I've got five brothers. They will believe if one comes back from the dead. It's the same type of faith because Abraham doesn't have that kind of power. Never did, never will. Just like with Elijah. Elijah never had this kind of power to where one would pray to him or with Abraham that Abraham could send someone back from the dead. It shows where their faith is, and it's not from the biblical text. It's not faith in God. Not truly. It's, it's some sort of craziness, some sort of traditions that have been handed down, other things that have been handed down, and they see them as actually being legitimate, actually being from God, when they're not. Now, Let's go back to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. It is a psalm of David because Psalm 22 tells us it's a psalm of David. It tells us who wrote it. David wrote it. And so we know that David lived around 900 B.C. But what David is writing is not anything David would ever experience. What David is writing here in Psalm 22 is the crucifixion scene as viewed from the one being crucified. If the one being crucified could have written a psalm while on the cross, it would sound like this. This is what was going on. Obviously, the one on the cross could not write a psalm nailed to a cross. But who else would write a poem 900 years before the fact describing the major event of human history, the overriding event that would take care of the sins of the world? Who else could do that but God? 
Who else would have that, for lack of a better word, that kind of style to do that? Nobody else but God. Who had the ability to do that? Nobody else but God. This powerful psalm being written as though the one on the cross is writing it and it is too accurate. And Jesus quotes the first verse there on the cross as though, you could see it as a reminder, yeah, it would be, but also as though he's reciting it in his mind or perhaps composing it, but it's already been composed. It's already been composed 900 years earlier. But let's read this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what he says. Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Now we know that this is Christ being sacrificed. And we're going to get into more specifics. Matter of fact, some have already been given to us in verses 16 to 18 in our scripture reading. But here in this, we see Christ speaking to the Father. He's speaking to the Father. This is a trial. This is loaded, overflowing with physical pain and emotional pain. And these words, poetic as they are, express, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's poetic. That's poetry. Did God forsake the Christ? The answer to that is no. Never. I know there's some who preach otherwise, that God turned his back on the Christ being crucified. I don't see that, not because of some sort of idea I have of God, but because we have in this very psalm, verse 21, verse 21 ends with, you have answered me. Oh, that's not being forsaken. We go down to verse 24. For he has not despised nor abhorred the afflicted of the, uh, the affliction, not abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. Christ is there on the cross. God does not forsake him, does not turn his back on him. God heard him. He hears him. Now, we know, Luke 22, we could, we could turn there. Let's, let's just go ahead. Luke 22, beginning verse 41. Luke 22, beginning in verse 41, we see Christ in the garden. This is just really hours before he's going to be crucified. This is the night before he's crucified on the next day. And he was, verse 41, Luke 22, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. He's in agony. This is before he makes it to the cross. This is the, the, really these last moments of his freedom here in Luke 22, what we just read, before he's taken prisoner and he's going to be crucified. Now he's going to be put in a tomb. He's going to resurrect. And there's no putting him in prison after that. There's no killing him ever again after that. But here we have these words that he calls to the Father, if this cup can pass from me, let it pass from me. And the answer is no. And we've discussed this in our Hebrews class, that sometimes God can tell God no. That's a powerful lesson. 
God who is in the flesh, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the only begotten of the Father, is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, hours before he's going to be tried and crucified. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He adds that, but he's still in agony. He's still in extraordinary anguish, and no one's laid a finger on him yet. It is this emotional distress because he knows what's going to happen. And he says, let this cup pass from me. He asks. He's praying to the Father. And the Father's will is still done. Now here's a lesson for us all that's not intended for, for this lesson, but a lesson for us all. If God can say no to the Son, if, if the Father, God the Father, can say no to God the Son, He can say no to anybody because it's important. If he can say that because it was important that Jesus went to the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All these things that had been going on from the trial, which was a mockery of a trial, to the scourging, to the beating, to the humiliation, public humiliation, to now being on the cross, to his brothers having no faith in him, not believing him one bit, to people, I have no doubt, I have no doubt, people who he performed miracles on them or they witnessed miracles still there saying crucify him. Tremendous amount of anguish that is there. Now, let's go back to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Oh my God, I in verse 2, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, I am not silent. We just read that from, Psalm, uh, from uh, Luke 22. From Luke 22, beginning in verse 41. That is, that's true. In the night season am not silent. He's, he's, not, he's not silent. He has, this has been a prayer. This has been on his mind, and of course it is. This is not a cakewalk. This is not a breeze. Trials will always have an emotional duress to them. There will always be emotional stress, even when it is the Son of God, even when it is Him. There, it, he's 100% God. He's 100% man as well. He is God in the flesh. We talk about, well, we may not talk about it very often, but we talk about the dichotomy of man. It's been something that's talked about for centuries, that we are body and we are soul. The Bible teaches that, body and soul. Just that he's got a body just like the rest of us, but his soul, that's the Son of God. His soul is the Son of God in that body. And he too can feel the stress. He too can feel the anguish in all this. And he too can say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, he hasn't been forsaken, but he can feel like it. He can feel like it. And he too can express himself. Now, let's go to verse 3. And here we have a different section. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you, they trusted in you, they trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered, they trusted in you and were not ashamed. Here we have this turning, this, this idea of in the past. This is what occurred. They called to you, Israel called to you, and you answered. He's calling, and the answer happens to be no. He's calling, and the answer was, this is going to happen. The cup cannot pass away. The cup must be. What's the cup? In this instance, what he's describing is all of the pain and anguish leading to the cross itself, which is 
more pain and anguish. Now, verse 6, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let Him rescue Him. Let Him deliver Him since He delights in Him. Now what were some saying there at the cross? Others He saved? If He is the Christ, let Him come down from the cross. He can't save Himself. Others He saved, He can't save Himself. What's the deal with this? Well, this was already being described in Psalm 22. Already being described. They shoot out the lips, shake their head. Uh, he he trusts in the Lord. Let, he trusts in Jehovah. Let Jehovah rescue Him. Let's, let's watch this. Let Him do it. We'll see, we'll see what happens. But it was Jehovah who knew, and Jesus himself, who knew this had to happen. It had to happen for our sake, not for the sake of Jesus. Jesus could have, that Son of God could have stayed in heaven right there with the throne of the Father could have stayed there with the rest of the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all of them together, and just let the earth do whatever the earth was going to do and destroy it and let that be that. That there is no forgiveness of sins. But it's a, it is a love for us. That's why this was done, a love for us. That is why God could say no. It is a love for us why Christ said, not your will, but mine be done. But he can still note that this is agonizing. And I would dare say, dare say, that no person has ever gone through anything like this. Nobody. This, of course, was for Christ only, but no one has gone through anything like this. Of In the mind of God from the beginning, Jesus speaking about it in his ministry to his disciples, sometimes they are, it, it greatly upset them. They didn't entirely understand it, didn't know why he would even want to venture back into Jerusalem because they knew what he's been talking about. It all had to occur. Now, let's continue in verse 9. But you are he who took me from out of, my, out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. And there is none to help. And in fact, Jesus stated to Pilate that if my kingdom were of this world, then my disciples would fight. He would also have allowed Peter to have taken the next sword swing. Peter goes after Malchus, and I don't know exactly what he was aiming for, something at maybe the neck, maybe from the, the top of the head. In, either way, he, he cuts off Malchus's ear. Cuts off his ear. And Jesus puts an end to that and heals Malchus right there. People have come to arrest him. See, we just witnessed a miracle, and we're arresting this man. We just witnessed something extraordinary, and we're arresting this man? This doesn't seem right at all, and it's not. It's not right. There is none to help because the answer didn't lie in his disciples rising up to fight, nor did the answer lie of 12 legions of angels coming to, to the earth and ending it all. That wasn't the answer. The answer was precisely what occurred. He's tried. 
sentenced to death on the cross. And it is done. Verse 12, many bulls have surrounded me, strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. Here's this uh, poetic language. They gape at me with their mouth like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and my, my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. From, from the scourging, he would begin to bleed. From the scourging alone, he could very well have bled to death. From that alone, that could have happened. And here he is, my tongue clings to my jaws, and it is a truth that if your mouth gets exceptionally dry, your tongue does stick to the inside of your mouth. I don't know if you've ever had that occur to you, but in fact it does. And they do offer him uh, vinegar. They do offer him that. But we have uh, these words, you have brought me to the dust of death. For the dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. That's too specific. If we did not know what this was about before verse 16, now we do. They pierced my hands and my feet. Who is that? Is that poetic? That's literal. And we need to understand that in poetry and in the, the Bible, the Bible can go from that of poetic language. Poetry can do it too. Poetic language to what is absolutely literal. Absolutely literal. They pierced my hands and my feet. This makes this without a doubt prophecy. 900 years before it occurred. 900 years God had this poem written. And David is the pen by which it is written. And here, just looking at these words, it looks precisely like the one who's on the cross pins this. Because this is what he's experiencing. Nobody else could put this down. Nobody else could know what he was thinking. Nobody else could know what, what he was going through. But here, he's talking about his tongue clings to his jaws. He could talk about that his bones seem to be out of joint. His heart is like wax, melted within him. It all seems like that. I can, verse 17, I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. Verse 18, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. That's an interesting thing for David to write because nothing like that occurred in David's time. David cannot be talking about himself. He's got to be talking about somebody else. Matter of fact, this, we can call it a tradition, this practice that was done was done among the Roman soldiers. And we see, once we get into the New Testament and get to the crucifixion of Christ, that's precisely what they're doing. The last possessions of the, of the one being executed, of the prisoner, the last possessions. You have this select group, last group of men here in charge of the execution that they will cast lots for his clothing. Not a practice among the Jews in David's time, or really any time as far as I know, but it would be under the Romans. How would David even come up with this? How would he know this? Because this didn't originate with David. This came from God. God sent this. God gave this. God, who can tell us things that are yet in the future as though they've already occurred. 
which is what Psalm 22 is doing. It, it would seem as though it's occurring right then and there. Now, verse 19. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. He's not saying, why have you forsaken me? He's saying, now, don't be far from me. Hasten to strengthen me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. And here are these words, you have answered me. How is that? You have not allowed your Holy One to see corruption. Did He die? Yes. Nor kept His soul in Hades. Did that happen? Yes, Christ died. Did His soul go to Hades? According to Scripture, He did. And He returned. And here's the one who resurrects on Saturday, sorry, Sunday morning. Here is the one who dies Friday afternoon. He resurrects on Sunday morning. Here is the one who is then described as the one who was dead, but is alive forevermore. He's the one described as having the keys of Hades and death. He has those keys. A key that Elijah didn't have. A key that Abraham didn't have. That belongs to the Son of God to have. And he's only on the cross for a limited period of time, and he's dead. Now, his body is taken off the cross at that point, but he's dead. You have answered me. Now we come to these words, and these are words of victory. I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. The assembly, I will praise you. This was done while Jesus, you know, the, the words, the flesh is willing. I'm sorry, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's a universal thing for humanity. That's a universal thing. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You think that didn't wasn't the same for Christ? It was the same for Christ. The spirit is willing, but the, fle the flesh is weak. That's the same thing for atheists. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's why the atheists can be at war with themselves, and quite often they are. Uh, an internal battle. But we see here that Jesus now speaking in these, these terms, I'll declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of your assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify Him and fear Him. All you offspring of Israel. Victory. After those words, you have answered me. Did He take Him off the cross? No, not until His body's taken off the cross, but He's dead. You have answered me. He continues on. <laughs> he continues on. You have answered me. And everything is fulfilled. Everything is fulfilled. The promise is fulfilled. And these were massive. The salvation of mankind is massive. And his blood goes not only to save us here in the distant future, but also to those of the distant past. Going back to Abel, to Moses, to, to it's in speaking of, of various people in, in Hebrews chapter 11, all of them acted in faith, in faith of what God told them. Let's just, let's go to, to Hebrews 11 real quick. Hebrews 11. Just want to, to show some things. We've, we've noted it before. Verse 24. This is talking about what was known by those of the distant past. What was known. They, weren't, they didn't have Scripture at that point. Moses is going to write that, but in time. He's going to be over 80 years old, or at least 80 years old by the time he starts writing. 
he's, God inspires him to write. But verse 24, Psalm 11, verse 24, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. He knew there was a reward. He Look at, and also the, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than what was in Egypt. What would he even know concerning that of the reproach of Christ? What would, he knew something. He knew something. Obviously, they knew something because they are living by faith and obeying God. That's what they're doing. And they were looking for, those in the ancient, ancient past were looking for their own salvation, which could not be done until the Christ came to this earth and died for us. Getting back to Psalm 22. Verse 24. Verse 22, verse, uh, uh, chapter 22, I'm sorry, Psalm 22, verse 24. We read this earlier. We're going to read it again. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He did not despise the Christ on the cross. Nor has he hidden his face from him. He didn't do it. While it may have felt like it, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? While it may have felt like it, it was not. On the other side, there was no abhorrence. On the other side, I mean at death. At death, there is only that of victory. When he cried to him, he heard. He heard. Verse 25. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. Now, we asked this question earlier in our class. We ask it again now in Psalm 22. Earlier it was Daniel 2, but now Psalm 22. Did this occur? Because we all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. Might I remind all of us that we live on the other side of the world of where this happened? We live some 2,000 years after this happened. We are, I can speak for myself with some amount of confidence. I am a Gentile. I cannot know your genealogy whatsoever. But typically, I think, by and large, we are a Gentile audience here. And here also, we are of that next generation and that next generation means future generations it's not just one future generations and here we are those who had not been born of where these things would be recounted did this happen is it by accident is it by happenstance is it by luck is it by chance no it's by sheer design it is by the working of God, that all this occurred. Don't turn away from the truth. You do yourself great harm. Even when it seems to be painful, don't turn away from the truth. It doesn't matter what's popular. There's always been something popular. You know, we only live this life once and we're terribly inexperienced at it. There's always been something popular. There's always been the enemies of God. There's always been ideas that contradict the Bible. There have always been those that are enemies of Christ. There's always been that. And Satan works people up and wants to destroy everyone, including the righteous. Wants to destroy everyone. Don't get all worked up at what the world says 
or the ridicule that happens to be, you live with that. You live with it. But don't turn away from the truth. Because here we see everything about this, everything about this song occurred, but not at 900 B.C. It occurred considerably later. And we will, we, we're repeating this in our class. We'll say it again now. These things cannot be faked. It's from God or it's not from God. Truth is one or the other, and it's proving itself through the evidence presented, evidence that is found in our actions just this morning. Evidence pointing, it's got to be from God. Now, let's, I want to read verse 27 again. All the ends of the earth, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. Now, it's not saying everybody in the world. It's just talking about this is going to go worldwide. This is, going to, this is going to the Gentiles. This is going all over the place. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. In Revelation chapter 7, we see where every tribe, tongue, nation, family is being represented that there is someone in heaven from every tongue, nation, and tribe every kingdom there's someone there there's someone there from not everyone who spoke that tongue not everyone who was from that tribe not everyone who's from that kingdom or that nation not everyone because never not everyone's going to obey but some will some will and the bible never says that everyone will matter of fact jesus is very emphatic that many will not now verse 28 for the kingdom is the lord's and he rules over the nations the kingdom is the lord's the kingdom that he's going to set up that he did set up in the first century after jesus was crucified his blood purchased the church he establishes the church. Now verse 29, all the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. A posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people. This is this is, us. this is one of those places that it's talking about us. Not alone, not by name. It couldn't do that. And I mean, it would <laughs> take up too much space. But talking about those generations, those people who will be born, they're going to hear this. It will be declared to them that He has done this. And here, this very day, this very minute, we're doing that. We're doing it. It's extremely difficult to predict what's going to happen tomorrow. Very difficult. And we know that how often do weathermen get it wrong? Yeah. Yeah, a lot. And they're using a method to try to predict the weather. They're not trying to predict the future so much, but try to predict the weather. Trying to predict the future for, for tomorrow is extremely difficult to do. And if you got it right, it's only because you got lucky. It's only because of chance that you were able to do it. There were certain things that you were determined to do. And as it turned out, you were able to do it. But try to predict things 100 years in advance. You can't do it. How about 200 years, 250? What about 900 years? You can't do it, but God can. When we say that the Bible proves itself, it does. 
It is a frightening thing, actually. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, I, and I have no shame in saying it. It's not, it's not shame. It's not bragging either. But I remember the first time I was in a real, and I mean real, study of the book of Daniel, which we were just discussing, the book of Daniel. There were chills that went down me because I realized I had studied those things from secular history. I had studied those things, and I knew that's true. That's absolutely true. And from something like Psalm 22, concerning that of the Christ dying on the cross, but then what occurs afterwards, going all the way to a, gen the, a, a generation that isn't even born, I should say generations that aren't even born, for 2,000 years, it's still happening. It's still happening because those last words there in, in Psalm 22 sound like a perpetual thing. And they are a perpetual thing until Christ brings it to an end at His return, which we need to keep in mind always. We're going to be judged individually, not as groups, not as nations, not among, uh, as, as in groups of peers or in families or in tribes. It's in individuals. It's what you did and what you didn't do. And God will keep His promises. He is not harsh. He's just. But He's also loving and He's merciful. And His mercy is extended. God does everything. Even denying His own Son escape from the cross. He, if He's willing to do that, the news is He has a tremendous love for us and wants us to be saved. Now it's up to us to go in how are we saved? And the New Testament is very specific. But you must learn it. From the words, we learn. And we're to have faith. Some people can take these words and have no faith in them whatsoever. None. But we learn and we develop faith, and it's a personal faith. It's not just handed to us miraculously. It is a personal faith, and it is a struggle that one must continue because it requires also a faithfulness of following those words, and those words also tell us that we must repent of our sins. Selecting the correct path, the path that Christ calls us to take, not what the world would have us to do, but the one Christ calls us to. And it is that path that, from repentance, understanding what we are to be doing, and there's also that of confessing that faith. So it does require faith, yes, but faith also that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that we must have faith that He is the Son of God, and be willing to confess that. Because even among the rulers, some believed that He was the Christ, but would not confess it because they feared the Jews. They wanted the praise of men rather than the praise of God. Well, if we deny Him, He'll deny us. If we confess Him, He'll confess us before His Father and before the holy angels. That's precisely what He said He would do. But... We are also be baptized. Those things must be done, so too must baptism. And our sins are washed away. And we are brought into the kingdom that He promised. Even in Psalm 22, speaks of that kingdom. And that kingdom is the church. And it continues today. And will be all the way until Jesus be on this earth all the way until Jesus removed this earth 
Now, the church continues on. The church continues on in eternity. The world doesn't. Those empires don't. But his kingdom does. This morning, if you need to respond to the invitation, if we can help you in any way, we ask that you come as we stand and sing.